Uh, hello, this is uh, History 1302. This is going to be Lecture 11B, World War II, uh, Pearl Harbor to the conclusion of the war. So we're going to finish this up. Uh, if you're paying attention uh, through the Canvas uh, or through uh, uh, any other uh, learning management system for this being an online course. Uh, this is the end of uh, module two. So once you're finished with this lecture, you're ready to uh, take uh, exam uh, exam two. So uh, let's get this done. Let's wrap this up uh, and move forward here. Um, Americans have a tendency to mark American, our own involvement in World War II with the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, but the United States, it should be fairly clear, uh, the United States was already starting to retreat from isolationism uh, and getting itself ready to be involved in World War II uh, well before the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Uh, for example, in 1937, uh, the USS Panay incident occurred in the South China Seas. Uh, the USS Panay was a gunboat a United States Naval gunboat that was escorting standard oil tankers uh, out of China and into the uh, over to the United States refineries. Uh, and part of the way Japan viewed the, uh, the Pacific theater and the rest of Asia was that it, that area was theirs and all of the resources in Asia belonged by rights to Japan, kind of the way the United States very similarly looked at the uh, at the Western Hemisphere and said all of those areas in Latin America, for example, uh, are American protectorates and places that the United States should be exploiting and not other parts of the world. So Japan attacked this uh, USS Panay. Uh, now they uh, Japan claimed that they did not realize that this was a U.S. vessel. Uh, they apologized for the attack. Uh, and all of this. But uh, nonetheless, the United States still looked at this, uh, obviously, as an act of aggression. It didn't trigger the attack uh, and didn't trigger any sort of um, any sort of military response. Uh, however, it did trigger an embargo of certain types of items. The United States, as a consequence of the USS Panay incident, uh, announced an embargo of oil, tin, scrap metal, and rubber on Japan that extended uh, into 1939. Now, in addition to the USS Panay incident, which again, did it nearly sparked war between the US and Japan. It, it didn't actually spark it, but it nearly did. The United States also started stepping away from the quote unquote neutrality, if you will, of the neutrality acts. Uh, as you might've guessed from the last lecture, the neutrality acts had to be recertified each year. And by 1939, as World War II had actually started in Europe, uh, the United States Congress, when it recertified the Neutrality Act of 1939, one of the things that it did uh, was that it put in place a so-called cash and carry provision, uh, meaning that the United States would actually sell weapons to belligerents, but we would not loan money to the belligerents, nor would the United States actually transport the weapons. So essentially what the United States was saying with cash and carry was that a country could buy weapons uh, and ammunition for that matter from the United States, but they were going to have to provide all of the financing. They would have to pay in full for the, uh, for the weaponry uh, and the like. And they, that country would have to provide the transportation. The United States is not involved in any of this. In 1940, the United States also engaged in a trade with, uh, with Great Britain uh, called the Destroyer for Land Bases Act, which subverted uh, the Neutrality Act. Uh, and it's literally what it, uh, what it sounded like. Uh, Japan, excuse me, the British uh, were losing vessels at an incredible rate. Uh, in the early parts of World War II, courtesy of German submarines. The, the British knew that the United States had literally hundreds of thousands of tons of decommissioned vessels. And the British sim said simply, we'll buy them. We don't care. Uh, we don't care if they're old. We don't care if they're out of date. 
Uh, we want them because it's it's a numbers game as far as they saw it. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt was concerned that that would actually subvert the neutrality acts by selling them. So what the State Department did was they arranged for a trade. The United States got access uh, to land bases all across the globe, British uh, land bases. Uh, and then the last subversion of the neutrality acts was uh, was lend lease. This was an agreement that primarily benefited the Soviet Union. The United, the United States had engaged, had already created the cash and carry policy, but the Soviets made it clear that they could not actually purchase weapons. They couldn't afford to purchase weapons, ammunition. They couldn't afford uh, supplies. They couldn't afford trucks and all of these sorts of things. So what the United States came up with the idea of was that they would lease this equipment uh, to the Soviet Union, or they would simply, uh, in worst case scenarios, lend this stuff to the Soviet Union. Uh, now, this was a controversial thing to begin with, because a lot of people uh, argued that for the last two decades, the United States had refused to recognize the Soviet Union. However, uh, the State Department argued that the Soviets were creating a separate front on the eastern front of Europe uh, during World War II, that they were absolutely critical to stopping the uh, the Nazi advance. Uh, they were occupying the Nazis in a part of the world that was taking away uh, from uh, their ability to control Western Europe. So a lot of uh, people in the State Department supported this on that basis. Congressmen who supported neutrality or supported isolationism, uh, like uh, Bob Taft of Ohio, for example, said that what we're doing by lending uh, equipment like this is we're, we're literally just playing around with the ideas of neutrality. He said of Lend-Lease that you would no more lend uh, someone ammunition and weapons like this. You'd no more lend them that than you would lend them a piece of chewing gum, with the implication being that once it's used up and all of that, you don't want it back. So this is just this is absurd on its face that all this is is an attempt to subvert the neutrality acts. Uh, in addition to all of this, uh, Franklin Roosevelt also in 1940 instituted the first peacetime draft in American history. Franklin Roosevelt, uh, to put it bluntly, was at a point where he was going to drag Americans kicking and screaming out of neutrality. Uh, if that was what it was going to take. He was telling Americans by saying we're engaging in this quote unquote peacetime draft. He's telling them we're going to war sooner rather than later. And you're just going to have to prepare for this fact. OK, then Roosevelt also uh, in his 1941 State of the Union address uh, gave a speech that came to be known as the Four Freedoms speech. And this was really important. Uh, in the so-called Four Freedoms speech, Roosevelt said that this is not; these are not just American ideals. These are things that people across the globe should be entitled to. The Four Freedoms were, uh, as you see on the screen here, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. But more important, the, the more important thing than just laying out what these Four Freedoms were. Roosevelt also said it's the job of the United States to make sure that these are protected freedoms for everyone. So he essentially was saying in this Four Freedoms speech that we're going to war and we're going to war to protect these types of values. Even before the Four Freedoms speech, Roosevelt had even given a speech called the Quarant that was uh, colloquially known as the quarantine the patient speech. Uh, in this particular speech, Roosevelt referred to the fascism of places like Germany, Italy, uh, and Japan, uh, as well as their open militarism and aggression. He referred to that as uh, a compared, it, compared it to a sickness and said that when we have people who get sick, we quarantine the patients, we quarantine the sick, we don't isolate ourselves. We don't, you know, we don't separate ourselves and say, well, we're not going to do what, what we do. We quarantine those who are sick. We separate them from everybody else. So what Roosevelt argued was that the rest of the world needed to isolate Germany, Italy, and Japan as opposed 
to isolating itself and saying, ah, we're not going to deal with you guys. So Roosevelt was signaling well before uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor that we're getting involved. We're going to be involved in this war uh, one way or the other. Uh, now, another way that we could see this uh, is in the, uh, the Atlantic Charter that Roosevelt signed uh, between the United States and Great Britain in May of 1941. Now, this is important. The, the Atlantic Charter is important, not because of the, the main points that you see on the screen here, which I'm really, I'm not going to ask you to remember all of those points, but I want you to kind of think of it uh, like a World War II version of sorts of the 14 points, because you can see uh, if you just if you go back and you pull up the 14 points, for example, you can see a lot of similarities between the Atlantic Charter and uh, the 14 points. For example, no territorial gains or aggrandizement by the United States or Great Britain. That's not too similar, but the United States and the British are the two sole signatories to this. And they're saying as a matter of course, once World War II is over, we're not going to be engaging in territorial aggrandizement, either the United States or the British. Territorial adjustments must be in accord with the wishes of the people's concern. That's a nice way of saying we're not going to be taking land away from anybody else and giving it away to other people, or we're not going to take, uh, for example, uh, we're not going to take the Balkans away. Uh, from a country and give them to yet another country. Uh, universal self-determination is going to be part of the Atlantic Charter. Uh, trade barriers are to be lowered across the globe. There's a, there is to be, quote, global economic cooperation and advancement of social welfare. Essentially, this is an export of New Deal, the New Deal ideas, very similar to when uh, Woodrow Wilson was talking about exporting progressivism. The Atlantic Charter contains that ideas, those ideas of freedom from want and fear, freedom of the seas, and then it also called for a general disarmament in the post-World War II era. Now, what's important about this Atlantic Charter is not so much the points here, but the idea that the United States and the British have signed this agreement, one that says this is our vision for the post-war world. This is how we see this world playing out. So essentially what the United States is doing is they're taking that idea of neutrality, isolation, and going, doesn't matter anymore. We're not doing that. We are going to shape, we are consciously going to shape the post-war world. Now this is, again, this is uh, in May of 1941. This is seven months before the attack on Pearl Harbor. So it's pretty uh, critically important in dragging the United States out of isolationism. Uh, however, the thing that actually does drag the United States out one way or the other, unequivocally pulls them out of isolationism, uh, is the attack on Pearl Harbor on uh, December 7th, 1941. At 7.55 a.m., Japanese torpedo bombs fell on Pearl Harbor, the base uh, for the United States' main Pacific fleet. Uh, the torpedoes were launched at docked ships, uh, and within minutes, uh, the bulk of the United States' Pacific fleet uh, had been destroyed. There was a second attack at Pearl Harbor at 9 a.m., but it was unnecessary. The, the first attack had done virtually all of the damages. Uh, Almost all of the planes at Pearl Harbor uh, were destroyed. Seven out of the eight battleships the United States had at Pearl Harbor had been sunk. However, this was not a complete disaster for the United States Navy. Japan failed on, a, on some very important fronts. Uh, some of you who may be involved, who may be interested uh, in World War II uh, trivia and the like probably already know that there were, there were no aircraft carriers at Pearl Harbor at this point. The aircraft carrier fleet was already on maneuvers elsewhere in the Pacific. Had they been at Pearl Harbor and those aircraft carriers been destroyed, that would have been really damaging for the United States. However, uh, that didn't happen. Uh, but in addition to that, Japan failed to destroy uh, power facilities at 
uh, Pearl Harbor. So while there was some momentary loss of power, uh, power uh, was restored fairly quickly at Pearl Harbor. The Japanese failed to destroy fuel depots at Pearl Harbor. Uh, they failed to destroy ship repair facilities at Pearl Harbor. So as bad as this was, and the pictures that you've seen here should give you an idea of how difficult this was and how troubling this was. It was not a complete and utter disaster at Pearl Harbor. It was bad. I don't want to give you the wrong impression, but it was not a complete disaster. Uh, it was followed by attacks uh, at U.S. bases in Guam and throughout Southeast Asia. It was without question one of the boldest attacks in military history. Uh, and with in very short order, with one dissenting vote, uh, the United States declared war uh, on Japan. Two days later, Germany and Italy declared war on the United States, uh, with the United States subsequently declaring war on both Germany and Italy as well. World War II cost the United States thousands of casualties and had enormous effects on American society. As I mentioned at the start of this stuff in Lecture 11a, war is a transformative experience, and World War II is no different. Uh, it's, it's not an exception in that regard. World War II expanded the power of the presidency. It solidified this idea of an imperial presidency, meaning that the president takes powers, the president gets powers that had not previously been granted to the president and exercises that power. So the idea of the imperial presidency is solidified through World War II. Franklin Roosevelt was given virtually uh, free reign in how he handled uh, the war effort. Uh, there was not a lot of uh, checks and balances, if you want to put it that way, uh, on Roosevelt's actions uh, throughout uh, World War II. Uh, World War II also led ultimately to increased rights for Mexican Americans and African Americans by the 1960s. World War II also caused a tremendous amount of social upheaval. Uh, we see the rise of the Sun Belt, <clears throat> excuse me, and the Gulf Coast during World War II. They are directly uh, due to World War II. Uh, and Probably most importantly, from a social perspective, World War II ended Great Depression era unemployment virtually overnight. All of a sudden, with the massive explosion of the defense industry in the United States, there is practically full employment in the United States. But there were some other changes, too, that were produced uh, by World War II. Uh, there were fashion changes in the United States with wartime shortages for fabric. Uh, virtually every bit of fabric that could be could be obtained wound up going to the United States militaries to make uniforms and to make combat uh, combat wear uh, and the like. So men, for example, stopped wearing cuffs on their trousers. Uh, they stopped wearing pleated trousers. They stopped wearing vests. The two-piece suit uh, came into vogue during World War II. They stopped wearing double-breasted suits during World War II. Uh, women stopped wearing ruffled blouses. Women's uh, dresses actually became shorter. Uh, they stopped being uh, dresses that went to the ankle and started coming uh, just below the knee. Uh, and again, the, the simple reason for this is that every bit of fabric that could go to the military went to the United States military. Uh, some areas in this country suffered depopulation. Uh, there's a reason why the Midwest became known as the Rust Belt during this era. A lot of industries moved out of the, of the Midwest and started moving into places like Texas, California, Oregon, Washington. We see an explosion in population in all four of those states. And then again, there's a huge social change in terms of the lives of women. Uh, over the course of World War II, 16 million men are going to serve in the military, not all at once over the course of the war. And women were going to be the ones that were picking up the slack in the workforce. Women are going to go into uh, working in factories and they're going to perform brilliantly. They are going to create what Franklin Roosevelt referred to as the arsenal for democracy during World War II. At the start of World War II, only about 4% 
of white married women worked outside the home for wages. But by the end of the war, 50% of white married women worked for wages outside of the home. So it became overwhelmingly exceptional before the war to being the norm during the war. Uh, the person who is going to be responsible for mobilizing uh, women during this era uh, is going to be a woman named Ovita Culp Hobby. She ran a group called the Women's Army Corps, uh, later became the second uh, woman appointed to a cabinet position uh, in the Roosevelt administration. And under her leadership, millions of women are going to go to work in the factories of the United States, becoming the symbol of working women uh, during World War II. They're going to becoming be, they're going to become Rosie the Riveters, as they were referred to during this period. Women are going to build the planes, the battleships. They are going to build the tanks. They're going to build all the war material. They're going to be responsible, as that picture in the middle uh, suggests. They're going to be responsible for the quality control of the ammunition that is produced. They are a part. They've got their hands in every part of how this uh, arsenal for democracy gets created, even uh, up and coming actresses like Marilyn Monroe are going to be part of this and they're going to become Rosie the Riveters as they're going to be part of industrial films, encouraging women to actually go to work in these industries, saying that they can actually be a part of this massive patriotic push. Now, uh, this is an incredible uh, social change. But we also see social changes elsewhere. Uh, for example, uh, African Americans and Mexican Americans are going to see uh, differences. At the start of this war, at the start of World War II, that US population of 13 million African Americans still had about 10 million in the South, uh, despite the so called Great Migration uh, of the World War I era the black population in this country was still overwhelmingly in the South. It was still overwhelmingly made up of tenant farmers and sharecroppers. Uh, so there hadn't been much of a change, but World War II created a huge change. One big change that's going to happen is, is that millions are going to be moving northward and moving into urban areas in the South to work in defense industries. So they're going to abandon agricultural pursuits and African-Americans are going to start working in these defense industries. But there's also something else, and I think this is much more important uh, than moving into industrial pursuits and the like. African-Americans, and in particular, it's led by a very strong and vibrant black press of the era. They understood, African-Americans and the black press understood that World War II was going to force Americans to confront something about themselves. They're going to have to face a gross contradiction. Chief among them is that the reason the United States, the stated reason the United States is fighting against Germany, for example, is that we're fighting to, quote, end racial tyranny, that the United States is fighting to stop the racist policies of Adolf Hitler and Japan to a lesser extent. And they're doing this while maintaining Jim Crow racism at home here in the United States. A lot of people within the black press were calling out the United States on this. And a, a labor union leader and socialist party leader named A. Philip Randolph was going to do exactly the same thing. He announced the beginning of what he called the double V campaign, two V's, double V campaign, victory at home over racism and victory abroad over racism, hence the double B campaign. He threatened a mass march on Washington, D.C. if the government refused to act on uh, anti-discrimination members, uh, mess sorry, anti-discrimination uh, measures in the defense industry. They wanted, for example, uh, people who supported the double V campaign wanted equal access to jobs, equal access to housing, uh, in the defense industries of the United States, and they were willing to march on Washington, D.C. to do this. Now, given that Franklin Roosevelt, if you think back to the so-called bonus march, Franklin Roosevelt had come into office largely because of a mass march. So he was not keen on this idea of having a mass march 
to Washington, D.C. So he sat down with the leaders like A. Philip Randolph and others who were supportive of the Double B campaign to say, OK, how can we stop all of this? How can we keep the mass march at bay? And what can we do toward anti-discrimination? And ultimately, what Roosevelt sets up is something called the Fair Employment Commission to stop discrimination within the nation's defense plants. This is a really hugely important measure. The Fair Employment Commission becomes part of the permanent civil rights establishment within the United States. So it's done uh, for a very specific reason during World War II, but it sticks around in the post-war era as well. Now, this is one thing. Uh, it's one thing to engage in anti-discrimination measures uh, in civilian defense industries, but it is worth pointing out here that the, Ar the United States Army continued to fight in officially segregated units uh, throughout World War II uh, until the uh, things like the Battle of the Bulge uh, in Europe and uh, military conditions in the Pacific theater forced the integration of the United States Army. The need for manpower was so desperate in both of these areas that commander, commanding officers simply ordered African-Americans to the front to fight side by side with white units uh, as a way of preserving American uh, positions on the battlefield. So in many people's minds, World War II is the kickstart to the civil rights movement. It's something that the civil rights movement doesn't have the same ability uh, to start without it. Uh, Mexican-Americans are also going to see some significant changes out of World War II. Uh, after the United States war with Mexico in 1848, Mexican-Americans uh, across the Southwest of the United States lost control of property. Loss of property meant a loss of political power uh, and Mexican-Americans essentially became a migratory labor class, overwhelmingly became a migratory labor class. But World War II, again, produced changes. Hundreds of thousands of Mexican-Americans are going to abandon, again, abandon agricultural pursuits and move into uh, uh, the defense industries. Hundreds of thousands of women, Mexican-American women, are going to become, uh, become their own version of Rosie the Riveters. Uh, there are going to be uh, Mexican immigrants like Marcario Garcia, uh, who's uh, an immigrant to the United States, who winds up joining the United States Army, uh, earning a Congressional Medal of Honor uh, for his actions during World War II. I think it was 1948, he actually became a citizen of the United States, uh, and he kind of becomes an avatar for what can be accomplished in the United States uh, by doing, uh, by serving the country. Uh, but just so we don't get the wrong idea about all of this stuff, uh, it isn't all rosy throughout all of this stuff, as bad uh, as things like, uh, or as good as things like uh, the Mexican-American Rosie the Riveters, as good as what happened with Mercario Garcia was. Uh, the United States also engaged uh, in a very ugly program that was hailed as opening the border called the Bracero Program, uh, but it wound up actually making tons of Mexican-Americans uh, and Mexican immigrants incredibly sick and sending disease south of the border. Uh, Garcia himself uh, wound up literally being beaten, uh, uh, brutally beaten, uh, after being refused service in a restaurant in Sugarland, Texas. Uh, there were uh, other uh, Mexican Americans who served during World War II who were refused burial uh, in various uh, cemeteries across the country. And then on top of that, there's massive race riots that are occurring throughout the United States during World War II. The worst uh, of these race riots was in Detroit, Michigan. The uh, various defense industries were being built up. They, many of these defense contractors built housing for their employees as well. So you'd have a factory and then you'd have factory owned housing. Uh, housing projects were built for white and black workers, uh, but a group of white workers in Detroit decided that the housing project that was set aside for African American workers was not acceptable. It was going to be it was going to be controlled by whites. So they decided literally to invade this housing project and take it over for themselves. Fighting broke out. Forty three people were killed in this Detroit race riot. 
Uh, during World War II, more, more than 200 race riots, again, broke out across the United States. So just like World War I, we had this, uh, we had this contradiction about fighting to make the world safe for democracy, and we've got race riots. Here we've got the contradiction as well. We've got a, a, where we've got a country where we say we're fighting to end racial tyranny abroad, and we're still engaging in it right here in country. Uh, now, there's another series of race riots uh, that develop here, uh, and this this set of riots is referred to as the Zoot Suit Riots. And what you see on the screen here is a number uh, of young Mexican-American men uh, in California, in Los Angeles County, to be precise, uh, who, are, uh, who had been rounded up, and they're wearing uh, versions of zoot suits. The zoot suit was a very distinctive style of suit uh, with longer than usual jackets, as you can see uh, from most of the young men in these pictures. The jackets are longer than usual. Uh, the suit is meant to be worn uh, incredibly baggy. Uh, probably the best example of the things that uh, marked the zoot suit is this young man right here that I'm circling. Uh, you can see that his pants kind of balloon out uh, and they're pegged at the bottom. Uh, this is all done uh, as a very sort of distinctive style. It's meant to, uh, to draw attention, obviously, uh, to the wearer. Uh, this was something that uh, young men across the country wore zoot suits, but uh, somehow it became more uh, it became more attached to African American uh, and Latinos uh, than than Anglo's in the United States, uh, and then making the zoot suit worse. To, excuse me, during World War II, was that with all of those fabric shortages that I referred to. A lot of people argued that wearing a zoot suit, which became popular in the 1920s and 1930s, people argued that by World War II, wearing a zoot suit was unpatriotic. It was simply uh, engaging uh, in a protest of sorts. Uh, so people really uh, started uh, being angry about zoot suit wearers. Uh, and this kind of exploded. This became uh, an explosion of violence. Uh, and the trigger for this uh, was a it was a murder that was referred to as the, as the Sleepy Lagoon murder uh, outside of Los Angeles in 1943. In August of 1943, there was Sleepy Lagoon as a reservoir. Uh, a 20 year old man named Jose Gallardo Diaz uh, died. He was uh, he was killed courtesy of some form of blunt head trauma. That was uh, the only thing that the coroner could actually definitively say uh, about. Diaz's death. Uh, the medical examiner affirmed this uh, and said that the result, the accident, the incident was likely the result of an automobile accident. But the LA County Sheriff's Department was absolutely convinced that Diaz had been killed as part of either a fight between rival gang members or a gang initiation. Uh, and specifically, they blamed the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department blamed uh, a group that was called the 38th Street Gang and their rivals, a zoot suit wearing group called the Pachucos. So uh, the zoot suit became very consciously attached uh, in the minds of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department uh, to this, this problem. More than 600 Latinos were arrested, uh, Latino teenagers, by the way, were arrested uh, on charge on various charges uh, or on various bases. Ultimately, 175 of them uh, were charged. The overwhelming numbers of them were actually uh, let go, but 175 were charged with all sorts of crimes that ranged uh, from assaults with uh, to uh, being out after curfew to actually murder. 17 were charged in the so-called Sleepy Lagoon murder case. The case began in January of 1944, uh, with 17 being charged in Diaz's death. Even in the moment, there were people who were following this uh, and legal observers who were following this that were pointing out that due process was being denied to these young men, that the trial itself was inherently unfair. Uh, one of the things that marked it as particularly unfair was when uh, a 
member of the LA County Sheriff's uh, Sheriff's Department Foreign Relations Bureau offered quote unquote expert testimony. The guy's name was Edward Duran Ayers, and he offered the following testimony about how he was certain that this had happened, how he was certain that this was a gang initiation. Uh, and he said the following, quote, the biological basis is the main basis to work from. When the Spaniards conquered Mexico, they found an organized society composed of many tribes of Indians ruled over by the Aztecs who were given over to human sacrifice. Historians record that as many as 30,000 Indians were sacrificed in one day, their bodies opened by stone knives and their hearts torn out. This total disregard for human life has always been universal throughout the Americas among the Indian population, which of course is well known to everyone. This Mexican element knows and feels a desire to use a knife or some lethal weapon. His desire is to kill or at least to let blood. That is stunning, stunningly ignorant testimony, but, te but it's offered as expert testimony. So it's no wonder with experts, quote unquote, like that paving the way for the LA County Sheriff's Department. It's no wonder that they looked at this and said, well, it's obviously a gang initiation or it's obviously gang violence. In the end, 16 of the 17 of these teens were convicted uh, on the murder charges of uh, murdering Jose Gallardo Diaz. Uh, however, all of the convictions were overturned the following year. However, this is not the end to the so-called Sleepy Lagoon murder case. Uh, later that year, largely due to statements like Ayers, uh, Ayers' statement, uh, press coverage of all of this stuff, negative uh, coverage of people wearing zoot suits, uh, courtesy of all of that, when thousands of naval personnel were on shore leave in Los Angeles, uh, they began assaulting zoot suitors. Uh, and it kind of devolved from an attack on people wearing zoot suits to a general attack on Mexican Americans. Uh, and uh, this resulted in two weeks of mass rioting and violence. And you can see here in this picture here, uh, what happened with the riot, the riots was literally naval personnel was going through the streets of Los Angeles. They were attacking people who were wearing zoot suits and they were literally stripping them of the suits and beating them. Uh, in many cases until they were unconscious. The rioting got so bad that after two weeks, uh, martial law was declared in Los Angeles, and the United States Army was brought down from the Presidio in San Francisco to reestablish order in San Francisco. Now think, of, or excuse me, in Los Angeles. Now think about, again, just try to put this together uh, with what's going on during World War II. The United States says we're fighting to end racial tyranny abroad. And yet you've got the Navy, naval personnel, carrying out this obviously racially motivated violence against Latinos. And you, the officials in this country thought it necessary to call in the army to put down the Navy, to reestablish order where the Navy had essentially created disorder. So obviously there's a problem in the United States. There's a paradox in that there's a time of, uh, and a massive call for patriotism and unity but there's obviously deep racial uh, and ethnic conflict in the United States as well. Now, the group that's going to suffer more than virtually anybody in this context is Japanese Americans, courtesy uh, of a, an executive order. Uh, there is going to be the phenomena of internment of Japanese American citizens uh, in this particular moment Japanese Americans are going to be given as little as 48 hours to dispose of their property and report to various internment camps like the one that you see here at a place called Topaz, Utah. Now, the executive order, and I've got the wording of it up here on the screen. I don't want you to take that to mean that you need to remember the wording of the executive order, but I want you to hear the wording of the executive order so that you understand what is uh, what's being what the intentions are here? Executive Order 9066, signed by the President of the United States, said, "Quote: 
Now, therefore, by the virtue of the authority vested in me as President of the United States and Commander in Chief of the Army and Navy, I hereby authorize and direct the Secretary of War to prescribe military areas in such places, those are the camps, to prescribe military areas in such places and of such extent as he or the appropriate military commander may determine from which any and all persons may be excluded and with respect to which the right of any person to enter, remain in, or leave shall be subject to whatever restrictions the Secretary of War or the appropriate military commander may impose in his discretion. Now, this is a purposely vague order. Okay, you might notice it doesn't it literally doesn't say anything in there about Japanese Americans. However, the California Attorney General, Earl Warren, made it very clear who this was aimed at in uh, in announcing his support of this and his willingness to carry this this order out. He said, quote, when dealing with the Caucasian race, we have methods that will test the loyalty of them. But when we deal with the Japanese we are in an entirely different field. So basically he's saying you can't trust uh, the Japanese people in the United States. Now, on the basis of the 1924 immigration laws that we talked about earlier, Japanese immigration was largely banned to the United States. However, about 275,000 people of Japanese descent had already emigrated before 1924. 115,000 of those uh, Japanese Americans lived on the west coast of the United States, mainly running uh, small fruit farms uh, and some small shops and the like. Uh, after Pearl Harbor, uh, Californians argued that Japanese Americans constituted, quote unquote, an alien element or a fifth front, as it's often referred to, uh, and that this alien element had to be contained so that they did not undermine the United States' war effort. Now, incidentally, there was a much larger Japanese population uh, or Jap uh, Japanese American population in Hawaii. However, they formed the majority of the population and the overwhelming majority of the workforce. So the outcry in Hawaii, where Pearl Harbor is located, wasn't nearly as great. Okay, so the outcry was far greater outside of Pearl Harbor. Now, over the course of these, uh, the lifetime of these internment camps, 112,000 Japanese uh, immigrants uh, and Japanese Americans uh, were sent to these internment camps. 2,000, uh, or excuse me, two thirds, about 70,000 of them, were actually American citizens. So uh, there is a massive repression once again. Uh, of the civil rights of American citizens in all of this. Uh, in many cases, uh, it was, uh, many historians have looked at this uh, as a desire to expropriate property. We'll see uh, why they saw that uh, in a couple of minutes. But uh, when Executive Order 9066 was uh, released, uh, throughout California, throughout Oregon, throughout Washington, Japanese Americans were told they had 24 to 48 hours, depending on locale to dispose of property and return report to an internment center. Now, these internment camps were frequently surrounded by barbed wire. They had armed guards. They had a firing line, meaning if a person advanced beyond a certain point, they were liable to be shot. There was scant difference between the internment camps and the Nazi concentration camps, not the death camps. I'm not comparing internment camps to the death camps, but in terms of the concentration camps and the, U, the internment camps that the United States used on these Japanese and Japanese Americans, there was very little difference. The, housings, uh, the housing was barracks style housing. There was virtually no in insulation in this housing. Uh, there was a single light, uh, so they were very poorly lit. Meals were held in communal mess halls. All toilet and bathing facilities was com were communal. There was a distinct lack of privacy. There were no schools uh, in these internment camps, despite the, uh, the presence of, of hundreds of, uh, and uh, and, uh, of children in these camps. Uh, the elderly 
Uh, we're given no preference in terms of any sort of treatment or comfort. Uh, the older generations of Japanese society, which were, uh, which were venerated, were allowed no authority over their, ch over their families. Parents were stripped of authority over their children. So there's virtually no, uh, there's no uh, preservation uh, of even familial structure within these camps. Nonetheless, 18,000 people managed to obtain early release from these internment camps for, of all things, agreeing to fight in Japanese American units uh, in World War II. Now, they were almost exclusively deployed to the European theater. There was a thought that it would be too dangerous to deploy them to the Pacific theater, but they did actually get deployed to the uh, European theater. Protests of the internment camps did actually come from across the United States. It's not like this was uh, done uh, without uh, anybody objecting. Uh, however, uh, the Supreme Court wound up essentially coming down on the side of U.S. military authorities. The two main cases uh, were the cases of Gordon Hirabayashi. This is uh, the so-called Hirabayashi case, Hirabayashi versus United States, of, and this happened in 1943. Gordon Hirabayashi was a University of Washington student uh, who was accused of violating curfew. The United States Supreme Court upheld his conviction for violating curfew, but chose not to address the issue of whether internment itself was constitutional or not. They simply said Hirabayashi was convicted of violating curfew, his conviction is legitimate, end of discussion. The Korematsu case was a little bit more, uh, was a little bit more nuanced. Uh, Fred Korematsu was charged with evading internment uh, and Korematsu, when he was convicted of this, uh, his attorneys argued that executive order 9066 uh, violated uh, the fifth amendment to the United States constitution. Uh, Korematsu's attorneys also argued uh, that there was no question about Korematsu's loyalty to the United States. Uh, and this was a fact that the prosecution in the Korematsu case stipulated to. The, the prosecution said, yeah, we don't believe that Korematsu himself, Fred Korematsu, was actually a threat to uh, American security. Uh, there was no question about his loyalty. And yet the Supreme Court upheld Korematsu's internment and upheld his conviction because of, as one of the justices wrote in his majority opinion, quote, the need to repose confidence in the leaders of the military who hold this as a necessity. However, it was a six to three dissent. Three of the justices actually dissented on this. Uh, one of them was a justice named Robert Jackson, who would wind up presiding over uh, the, uh, the famous Nuremberg trials where uh, Nazi leaders were uh, charged with war crimes uh, in the post-World War II era. Uh, Jackson's, uh, Jackson's dissent was on the basis of it's really th that we're playing a fine, we're walking a fine line between military necessity and military overreach. And we've got to make sure that we stop, that we don't engage in overreach in all of this stuff. So he argued it was better to come down on the side of uh, liberty and civil rights as opposed to military overreach. Uh, however, one justice, a guy named Frank Murphy, made it very clear how he saw uh, this ruling uh, and how he saw the majority ruling uh, when he wrote his dissent. And I'm going to read directly to you uh, from his dissent. He wrote, quote, I dissent, therefore, from this legalization of racism. Racial discrimination in any form and any degree has no justifiable part whatever in our democratic way of life. It is unattractive in any setting, but it is utterly revolting among a free people who have embraced the principles set forth in the Constitution of the United States. All residents of this nation are kin in some way by blood or culture to a foreign land, yet they are primarily and necessarily a part of the new and distinct civilization of the United States. They must accordingly be treated at all times as the heirs of the American experiment and as entitled 
to all the rights and freedoms guaranteed by the Constitution. So for Murphy, this was very clear. And yet uh, internment stayed as the law of the land until the post-World War II era. Uh, when World War II ended, uh, it's not like the internment camps wound up just going away. They stayed around until 1946. Uh, and when they did finally get closed down, it wasn't because the United States government uh, said, well, let's just end this. It was because of threats to drag the United States to the United Nations Security Council and ask for uh, war crimes charges to be brought against the United States. Then the United States backed down on this and said, all right, we're going to end the camps. When all in the aftermath of all of this, a lot of Americans were, argue, were arguing that there was a necessity here uh, during World War II. Uh, however, there were many who were uncomfortable with this necessity argument and pointed out that there was a massive loss of property and a massive loss of income as a consequence of this stuff. Uh, when a body got established in 1980 uh, called the Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians Commission, it, uh, it determined that the property losses of Japanese intern, Japanese American internees resulted in the, it was uh, or totaled, excuse me, $1.3 billion. Now that was obviously adjusted to inflation uh, and all of that. And total income loss was $2.7 billion. Uh, this led to this argument that there was an economic benefit to internment, that uh, Anglo-Americans could uh, were going to economically benefit from all of this. In 1948, Harry Truman established uh, the American Japanese Claims Act uh, and put a commission together uh, so that they could investigate uh, what who the internees were and what they might be uh, do uh, in terms of reparations. Uh, the United States uh, wound up having uh, Executive Order 9066 actually on the books uh, until 1976, when uh, Gerald Ford, who was president at that time, uh, discovered that this had this act had never actually been repealed. So uh, there could have been a usage of this act uh, in the Vietnam War era to detain other types of, uh, of emigres and people who were protesting and uh, arguing against uh, the Vietnam War. So it was, uh, there, were, uh, there was the potential for lots of fallout from Executive Order 9066. Ultimately, that Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment uh, wound up establishing a baseline uh, for reparations to uh, Japanese Americans. Uh, the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 uh, authorized payment of reparations to those uh, who had been in these internment camps and also uh, wound up uh, with the President of the United States when President Reagan uh, signed the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. Uh, Reagan also uh, offered officially an apology uh, for the process of internment. But obviously, this is something that didn't just end with the end of the war. It dragged on for another four decades. Uh, now, let's get to the, uh, the war itself, the military conflict. Uh, this is not going to be a guns and battles uh, display here. This is just going to be uh, an overview of the strategic aims of the United States and the Allies. Uh, over the course of World War II, 60 nations took part uh, in World War II. It was obviously the broadest and most expansive war uh, of, uh, of the time. Uh, it eclipsed World War I uh, in overwhelming ways in terms of cost, in terms of countries involved. The two sides, uh, for, for what it's worth, were the Axis powers, uh, Germany, Italy, and Japan for the most part, uh, although Algeria, Finland, and Hungary were also on the Axis side. Uh, the other side is the Allies, primarily the United States, Great Britain, France, the Soviet Union, and 49 other nations, so we're not going to go through the litany there. When this war began, especially with the United States involved, uh, the prospects for an Allied victory looked very grim. Uh, six months after Pearl Harbor had happened, uh, Japan conquered virtually all of the South Pacific and Southeast Asia and was pushing into India, 
Uh, the circumstances in Europe looked no better. Over the first 10 months of 1942, Germany sank more than 500 American ships in the Atlantic. So the United States, despite massive amounts of production, was finding it very difficult to resupply uh, the allies throughout Europe. Uh, and the United States, and it's I shouldn't just say the United States, all of the allies absolutely relied uh, on the Soviet Union to keep uh, the Nazis occupied throughout that era. Uh, the Germans were also surging uh, into the Suez Canal. Uh, they had conquered virtually all of North Africa. So they were in, uh, they were in kind of the driver's seat when it comes to uh, control of Europe and control of the world. Uh, there was a big victory, though. In September of 1942, the Soviet Union halted German advances at a place called Stalingrad. Stalingrad was, it's often talked about as, quote, the Battle of Stalingrad, but it was a series of assaults uh, that lasted for four months. Germany just assaulted and assaulted and assaulted and assaulted, and it wound up leaving one million Soviet soldiers dead in the process. Uh, in one Soviet division, for example, a Soviet division is 10,000 men. Only 341 men in that division survived. So this was an absolutely brutal fight on the part of the Soviets, a brutal victory on their part. But it did something really important. The German advance into the Soviet Union had been stopped. It was not going anywhere. So the, so the Germans, if they were going to try to if they were going to in any way continue that advance or that assault, they were going to have to bring troops uh, from Western Europe and resources from Western Europe to do it. Ultimately, they concluded uh, they could not actually do all of that. So the question for the United States in the first part of World War II is, who do we fight? Do, does the United States fight Japan first or does the United States fight Germany first? And then once you've made that determination, where do we do it? Germany became looked at as the bigger threat than Japan. So the United States decided on a fighting Germany first strategy, and they decide, so they decided on a Europe first strategy. But as far as fighting directly in Europe, the United States took a different approach. The, uh, the prime minister of Great Britain, Winston Churchill suggested a strategy that he referred to as, quote, nibbling at the edges. The thought was, is that in mainland Europe, Germany was too powerful. The Nazi regime was too powerful. A direct assault on mainland Europe would, res would clearly result in a defeat. So what the United States and the allies needed to do was nibble at the edges, find the parts uh, around the edges where the Nazis were at their weakest and attack those areas. Again, drawing resources away, forcing the Nazis to deal with these areas that were fringe, that weren't as important. And then ultimately, hopefully the allies would win in these edges areas. They would wind up building up a little bit of confidence in the process uh, and kind of push Germany back out of these areas. And it did work. Uh, to an extent, the United States and the Allies decided to try this in North Africa first. Uh, we're going to look at a map here in a second uh, to see where this is actually happening. Uh, it's happening all across North Africa uh, with Operation Torch. Uh, and then the plan is from there to jump up into Sicily and then ultimately move, quote unquote, up the boot is what the strategy called for into Italy with the idea that you push Germ the Nazis out of these areas in North Africa, then you push them into Sicily, you push them into Italy, and by fighting in Italy, you ultimately push them back into mainland Europe. Now, the Soviets, needless to say, are unhappy about this strategy because they are, I'm gonna use this little pen out here, they are fighting the Nazis out on the Eastern Front, and they are, they're dying in ridiculous numbers. So what they wanted was they said, if the United States is actually going to do this, if they're going to fight, then the areas that they should be shoring up are here in the East, not, you know, this sort of stuff out here. That's meaningless, the Soviets argued. 
But ultimately, as I mentioned, the United States chose the Europe first strategy and chose to fight in this nibbling at the edges strategy. So uh, it worked in terms of all of the stuff that Churchill wanted. It got the victories for the Allies. It got the Germans on the run. And finally, uh, the, in 1944, the United States and the British concluded now was the time for a direct mainland assault in, uh, in Europe, the uh, famous uh, D-Day assault. And we're going to look at another map here. Uh, this is uh, the attack uh, that's going to wind up leading into uh, D-Day. It's going to be a so-called cross-channel invasion. Uh, there are going to be all of these launch points. You can see here uh, all of these launch points from England. They're going to cross the English Channel and they're going to attack all of these beachfronts in France with the idea there's a very simple strategy or tactic at, uh, at the D-Day invasion. The United States and the Allies' plan is called attrition. They're going to put more men on that beachfront than hopefully the Nazis have bullets. It's not an elegant strategy. It is brutal. It's a smash mouth type of, uh, of tactic. But as the Allies saw it, it's the only way, it's the only possible way to assault the Germans. Now, the Germans, uh, the German high command, uh, many of them argued that obviously this is the, pl the place that makes sense to do a sort of invasion of Europe. However, Adolf Hitler had become convinced that this position here at Calais was the place where this invasion was going to happen. It, it, for him, it made perfect sense because the Germans, the Nazi command, had reconnaissance planes. They had reconnaissance photographs of this massive Allied buildup in Dover. So he was convinced the attack is coming from Dover, not into these areas uh, across the channel in France. Now, as far as those reconnaissance photos, what they had gotten, uh, what the Nazis had gotten was photographs uh, of a sort of dummy invasion that had been set up. Uh, literally, Hollywood uh, set designers and set builders had been brought into Dover to construct these bases, to construct uh, things that as you're flying overhead, if you look down on it, it looked like, you know, hundreds of tanks, thousands of planes and stuff like that. If you got too close, the ruse would be, you know, the ruse would be up so to speak. But from a reconnaissance standpoint, it looked like this massive buildup and Hitler fell for it. Now, that does not mean his falling for it made this assault any easier. It didn't. Uh, however, uh, it probably would have been uh, a simpler task for the Allies, uh, or it wouldn't have been, uh, it would have been a much more difficult task for the Allies had Hitler not ordered some diversion of resources uh, to Calais. Now, ultimately, what winds up happening with the D-Day assault is the Allies land. They wind up pushing the Germans back, and their plan is to just push them back into Germany, push the Nazis back into Germany. So they are attacking. Go back to our next our other map here. They're attacking an Operation Overlord in France, and the plan is to push in, push them back into Germany. Sorry about that. So they're coming from the west and pushing eastward. And the hope is, is that the Soviet Union, which has maintained this uh, eastern front, they will be in the east and pushing westward. So that at some point, both sides are just going to close in on the Nazis and that will be the end of it. Now, that's the strategic goal. Uh, ultimately, uh, it doesn't work out as well as it was, as it was hoped for. Uh, for example, uh, the Battle of the Bulge wound up uh, suggesting one of the problems of this attack in that uh, many of the United States uh, and allied forces wound up on this massive push into mainland Europe, into and starting to push through Belgium 
and back into Germany. It worked, but they outran their equipment. So they kind of had to sit and wait for this equipment to catch up to them, which allowed the Nazis, uh, the Nazi army to regroup and counterattack and push back to the West. Now, this is this whole thing is called the Battle of the Bulge, because what's happening is you can see these gray lines here. The Nazis are attacking at these various points and causing the defensive line, the defensive line to bow out or to bulge. OK, so if you want to think of it uh, in these terms, in these types of terms, if you've got a solid defensive line like this, what's happening to it, you can see it's not it's obviously not going to be as clean as I'm going to draw here. But what's happening is, is that it's bowing out. OK, if any of these lines collapse, if the Nazis make it through these lines, OK, if they break, then they're back into Belgium, they're back into France, and D-Day was for nothing. The attack or the invasion at D-Day would have been for nothing. It winds up being a matter of a manpower shortage and commanders of American forces at, uh, at this Battle of the Bulge saying we need soldiers and we don't care what color they are, send them to the front. Those soldiers, those black soldiers wind up coming to the front. They shore up all of these areas here and prevent the Nazis from breaking through. And ultimately they reverse this bulge. It winds up being a bulge in this direction. And ultimately by May of 1945, the uh, United States and the British and the Canadians have pushed eastward. The Soviets have pushed westward, and their goal, their strategic goal, winds up uh, coming to coming into being. In May of 1945, all sides wind up meeting in Berlin, and the war in Europe is actually over. Now, that doesn't mean the war itself is over, because there's still the matter of what to do in the Pacific theater. After Japan took Pearl Harbor, by virtue of their other victories, they wound up controlling one third of the earth uh, as, as part of that. Uh, so they, they were significant. They were a significant uh, part of this. But by the summer of 1942, their offensive power had been stopped, meaning their advance had been stopped. And there was now a question of how quickly can we start to reverse these? That's why the uh, because it had been stopped, there was a thought that the United States and the rest of the allies can just kind of wait a little bit on the Pacific theater. Uh, a convoy of ships, a convoy of Japanese ships uh, wound up being uh, stopped and destroyed at the Battle of the Coral Sea. Uh, the United States also destroyed an entire uh, Japanese naval fleet at a battle called the Battle of Midway, which is right here, uh, which wound up taking uh, a fair amount of Japan's power away, but it still took the United States three years of a strategy called island hopping uh, in order to win. And island hopping is literally what it sounds like. The United States and the allies are picking various islands that are part of uh, the Japanese conquest of the Pacific. And they're going to fight from island to island. They're going to hop from island to island defeat the Japanese on those islands with a goal of ultimately, if that's what it takes, ultimately going to mainland Japan. Japan would be the last island in the island hopping strategy. So it takes three years worth of island hopping and the use of nuclear weapons to defeat the Japanese. Now, uh, in order to defeat the Japanese, by 1939, it was clear that the Nazis were working on a secret project to develop an atomic bomb. The whole process had been exposed by Albert Einstein. He wrote a letter to Franklin Roosevelt basically telling him it would be a huge moral failing on the United States' part to let the Nazis get there first. So as a consequence of that, Franklin Roosevelt ordered the beginning of what became known as the Manhattan Project. Literally tens of thousands of scientists and physicists 
are going to work on this so-called Manhattan Project. The United States Congress is going to appropriate more than $2 billion to build these atomic bombs uh, within the Manhattan Project. And ultimately, it's going to be the product of the Manhattan Project that is used on Japan. Now, I don't want to muddy the waters on this, but I want to make it clear here. The atomic bomb was created, the project to create the atomic, the atomic bomb was created to keep pace with the Nazis, but ultimately it's used on Japan. All right. Now, the decision to drop the atomic bombs, and you've got the two of them on the screen here. Little boy was dropped on Hiroshima on August 6th, 1945. The uh, one called Fat Man was dropped on Nagasaki on August 9th, 1945. But the decision to do this was rife with controversy, even in the moment. It's obviously still incredibly controversial today. But a lot of people have made the argument that, well, it's controversial only in hindsight. Don't you believe that? It was controversial in the moment as well. Okay, The first atomic bomb that wound up being dropped, little boy, had the explosive equivalent of 20,000 tons of TNT. It turned Hiroshima into ruins. There was no warning given short of a few... Uh, leaflets that said, quote unquote, your city will be destroyed, uh, which really didn't mean anything because by the summer of 1945, dozens of cities across Japan had been destroyed courtesy of what was called saturation bombing. Uh, on top of that, uh, 13 million people were homeless as a result of these bombs. There was one bombing raid that killed 75,000 people. So leaflets saying that your city will be destroyed didn't carry the tone necessary for what these two atomic bombs were going to do. Uh, now, here is where I need to give you uh, a sort of warning that the pictures that you're going to see here uh, are going to be pretty, pretty graphic, much like when we uh, dealt with, uh, with lynching uh, in the United States. These are some incredibly graphic pictures. Uh, they may cause people some distress. Uh, but as I said then, I'm going to repeat it now. I don't believe in sugarcoating the past. I don't believe in pretending that things didn't happen. The atomic bombs had an awesome amount of destruction. And we need to remember that, that this wasn't just some sort of, well, you know, we've got these bombs, let's use them. They carried a tremendous amount of destructive capacity. On August 6th, 1945, a B-29 called the Enola Gay, took off and flew over downtown Hiroshima. The bomb that it carried exploded 600 yards in the air and was 300 times brighter than the sun. The temperature in Hiroshima reached approximately 300,000 degrees Celsius. At that temperature, granite melted within the city, uh, stone caught on fire, uh, even a river that ran through the city of Hiroshima uh, caught on fire. Anyone within a hundred, or excuse me, within a thousand yards of the epicenter, uh, excuse me, the radius of this bomb, uh, virtually evaporated. Four square miles of Hiroshima were flattened. The circumstances weren't much better uh, in Nagasaki. Uh, all clocks stopped at the same moment of the dropping of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and similarly in Nagasaki. Uh, courtesy of an electromagnetic pulse. A cloud of smoke, that mushroom cloud that you saw on the first slide, ascended 50,000 feet into the air and then condensed into a water vapor that sent a black rain falling over Hiroshima. Uh, that uh, black rain left red splotches uh, on anyone who was caught in it. Now is where we're going to start seeing some of those really graphic images of survivors of these attacks. Uh, within one hour, 100,000 people were dead and suffering from radiation burns uh, and burns from, the, uh, from, the, from that black rain. The population was literally dazed and wandering uh, as a consequence of these attacks. Uh, it was without question one of the most violent uh, attacks uh, in military history. 
Uh, radiation symptoms would ultimately take their toll, killing thousands of people. Uh, hair would fall out. Uh, a general body weakness uh, would be the uh, would ensue, uh, and then a drop in white blood cell count, and finally death uh, for these people who got the radiation sickness. Uh, some have argued that the worst of the after effects uh, was not even seen at that moment because uh, what this uh, what the worst effect is is a biological after effect. Uh, the the radiation caused all sorts of birth defects and genetic mutations that people in Japan are still dealing with three generations after the droppings of the atomic bomb. Now, there was a distinct case for dropping the atomic bomb and a distinct case opposing the dropping of the atomic bomb. And we're going to look at both of those uh, because, again, there were people who very consciously supported what Harry Truman did. Uh, and there were people who wildly opposed what Truman did. Uh, but make no mistake, Harry Truman uh, had a very important decision to make uh, in 1945 when this happened. Now, Franklin Roosevelt had created the Manhattan Project, but Franklin Roosevelt also died in April of 1945. So with his death, Harry Truman, his vice president, became the president of the United States. And he was the one who was going to be tasked with this incredible decision, this, uh, this monumental decision. Now, his defenders cite four basic reasons why it was legitimate to drop the atomic bomb. They point out that he could have continued the fire and the saturation bombing, but it simply wasn't working. It had not caused Japan to surrender yet. The estimates from people who said, yes, we can continue to do fire and saturation bombings, their estimates were that those types of bombings would lead to five times more deaths than the dropping of uh, atomic bombs at both Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that there would be way, way more deaths uh, as a courtesy of fire and saturation bombing. Secondly, his defenders point out that in order to not use the atomic bomb, it would have required a huge shift in American policy. The United States policy throughout World War II was, quote, unconditional surrender. World War II is literally the last war that is identified as, quote, unquote, a total war for the United States, where we engage every facet of our society against every facet of an enemy society. And rather than simply looking at completing strategic objectives or tactical obje objectives, the goal is, is to remove the enemy's will to fight. Okay, That's what's happening in a total war. So the only acceptable outcome in a, quote, total war is unconditional surrender. Now, Japan was willing to surrender on August 1st, 1945. However, it was a conditional surrender. They had offered only a conditional surrender. What they wanted was they wanted their military to remain intact and remain, for all practical purposes, in charge of Japan. Now, that was the big, uh, that was the big condition. And Truman and his adv Truman's advisors suggested to him that this, un that this conditional surrender was not acceptable. Only an unconditional surrender was acceptable. Thus, it was legitimate to use an atomic bomb to bring about an unconditional surrender. Now, critics also point out or argue that the atomic bomb was simply a part of the United States arsenal. Uh, of weaponry that, you know, we make weapons and we build weapon systems. Uh, we build, we create uh, bombers, we create bombs like this, we create uh, uh, ammunition, we create, uh, you know, other types of military weaponry to use them, not to hold them back, not to use them as a threat that we hold over somebody's head. We build these things to use them. So the atomic bomb was just a weapon in the arsenal. It was built to be used, and Harry Truman used it. There was nothing morally questionable about that at all. So they point out that 
certainly using the atomic bomb was a viable tactical option. And then finally, Truman's supporters also uh, maintained that an invasion of Japan was an, op an option. Invading mainland Japan as quote unquote the last island in the island hopping strategy was viable, but it would cost a minimum of 500,000 US casualties and a minimum of one and a half million Japanese casualties. That's a very high price. So Truman's defenders maintain the atomic bomb saved lives. It wasn't just American lives, but Japanese lives. That Truman's job was to end the war as quickly as possible with an unconditional surrender. And that even in the face of the first atomic bomb, the second bomb was necessary because Japan still did not move for an unconditional surrender after the first bomb. So these are the supporters. His opposition argued as follows. The people who opposed dropping the atomic bomb argued as follows. They argued that the use of the atomic bombs saved no American lives. Forget about Japanese lives, which is should be clear, it killed a lot of Japanese people. It saved no American lives. They pointed out that by August of 1945, Japan was virtually defenseless from the air. The, uh, there was no radar coverage in Japan, uh, and they pointed out that bombing missions, uh, and these were uh, not just uh, observers, but these were military experts of the era as well, who were pointing out that American bombers were flying their missions unopposed over Japan. So there was no imminent threat really from Japan. It was a matter of time. Secondly, Truman's opponents argue that the bomb itself, the first atomic bomb, did not end uh, World War II. The second bomb didn't even end it. Critics point out that the Truman administration end, uh, ended World War II with an acceptance of a conditional surrender. So all of this talk about the only acceptable outcome is unconditional, therefore we must drop the atomic bombs to force an unconditional surrender. Well, the United States ended up accepting a conditional surrender, okay, which was to allow the Japanese emperor to maintain his status within Japanese society. Now, what these critics are getting at here is, is that Japan offered a conditional surrender on August 1st, okay? So if you, could accept a if you could accept a conditional surrender on August 10th, you could have accepted it on August 1st too without the dropping of the atomic bombs. It's simply a matter of negotiating what the condition actually is. These critics, for example, don't argue that, you know, well, sure, they should have been allowed to maintain their military. Their point is, is that it's simply a matter of negotiating what the condition actually is. Third, the critics point out that Truman's claims, that the administration's claims of 500,000 casualties uh, on the American side, one and a half million Japanese casualties, they point out that these were a figment of Truman's imagination. These numbers existed nowhere, okay? The first time that 500,000 American casualties, one and a half million Japanese casualties, the first time that ever appeared in any record was when Truman wrote his autobiography and it was released in excerpt form in Life magazine. This was the first time that any American had ever heard 500,000 American casualties one and a half million Japanese casualties. In fact, the Joint Chiefs of Staff during World War II pointed out that an invasion of Japan would result in a maximum of 50,000 US casualties, not a minimum of 500,000. Now, I'm not gonna be here telling you that, well, it's only 50,000. 50,000 is still a huge number. But I think we could all agree, regardless of how we view any of these things, that there's a huge difference 
between a maximum of 50,000 and a minimum of 500,000. There's a huge difference between those two. So they point out that the, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff did not agree with the assessment that an invasion of Japan was even necessary or would be as deadly. On the necessary part of this, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff recommended simply a blockade of Japan. They said that if the United States created a real, a legitimate, enforceable blockade around Japan, that Japan would have been forced to surrender without a single shot being fired uh, within a matter of three weeks. So they argue that none of this stuff was actually necessary. Now, the fourth point that these critics make, uh, this is where there is a little bit of hindsight and naivete uh, in this argument. Uh, they argue that there were alternatives to directly dropping an atomic bomb, uh, such as dropping the atomic bomb uh, in a mountainside or in the, uh, uh, in the Pacific Ocean, as opposed to dropping it on a population center. Uh, even people who, uh, you know, people who were looking at this, uh, who said, you know, we shouldn't be, you know, dropping the atomic bomb on these population centers. Many people argue today that that would have been silly to drop the atomic bomb in the Pacific Ocean, because what it would have done was that it would have created tsunamis that would have not only wiped out marine life, but would have also probably literally wiped out Japan as well. Uh, and Dropping the atomic bomb in mountains, uh, you know, in a mountainside area, uh, would have wound up resulting uh, in tectonic issues, uh, and there would have been massive earthquakes and landslides and the like in Japan. That these were just not options uh, as, P as uh, to dropping the atomic bomb. And then there's also uh, this last point: critics have suggested, and this again, this is one that is hindsight. Uh, in, in totality. It argued that the real target of the atomic bombs being dropped was the Soviet Union. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting to you that these critics, there's, that there's a conspiracy theory out there that critics were saying, well, they meant to drop them on the, on the Soviet Union and they just missed. That's not what they mean. The Soviet Union had been engaged in all sorts of talks with the United States and the, the other allies uh, during the course of World War II. And at one particular conference at Tehr Tehran, in present day Iran, Franklin Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union sat down and agreed that the Soviet Union would enter the war in the Pacific 90 days after the war in Europe concluded. So the Soviets, would, according to this agreement, would have entered the war in the Pacific in August of 1945. And if they had, they likely would have been able to conquer and hold some territory. So critics have argued that the atomic bombs were dropped on Japan as a way of threatening the Soviet Union, not just ending this war as quickly as possible so the Soviets couldn't get in and get some territory, but also as a way to threaten the Soviet Union, to say, look, you need to see things our way. In between Tehran and the dropping of the atomic bombs, the United States and the Soviets were haggling with one another over what the future of Eastern Europe would be. The Soviets wanted to have uh, so-called buffer states, and Harry Truman argued that there needed to be free and democratic elections across Europe. And some have argued, these critics have argued, that Truman ordered the dropping of the atomic bombs as a way of saying, we're going to end this war quickly, and as a way of showing the Soviets that we have this massive destructive capability, so you better do things our way in the post-war world. So these critics have argued that dropping the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki was not just the final act of World War II, but it was also the first act in a new conflict that would be called the Cold War. But the Cold War is a topic for module three. So this concludes module two. Good luck on exam two.